In the fall of 1967, a zoology major and herpetologist by the name of Terry Cullen would stumble across what seemed to be an amazing find in a small attraction in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This attraction was curated by a man by the name of Frank Hansen, and the exhibition was staged in a refrigerated trailer that Hansen would tow around to different small events throughout the Midwest. In the dead center of this trailer, and frozen solid in a block of ice, a man supposedly from a time long lost to history, laid suspended in his icy coffin for anyone with a quarter and a dime to see. Immediately after witnessing the quote-unquote remains, Colin unsuccessfully attempted to gather the interest from many well-known anthropologists, many of whom were professors of academia. After his failed attempts to gain the attention of mainstream science, Colin then reached out to the author of a successful book on hairy hominids by the title of Abominable Snowmen. Legend come to life, all verified fact, author and naturalist, Ivan T. Sanderson. It just so happened that Sanderson was hosting another very well-known and respected voice in the field, the Belgian zoologist, explorer, writer, and cryptozoologist Bernard Huevelman. It was on December 17th of 1967 that Sanderson and Hoyleman made it to Hansen's place in Winona, Minnesota, and finally got a chance to witness the frozen man. Is this the best evidence? Is this the best evidence of a large, hairy, upright walking ape, or the missing link in the theory of our evolution? Whatever it was, one day it just disappeared after the FBI and the Smithsonian took interest and was replaced by a rather sad attempt at a, re at a recreation. This is the story of the Minnesota Iceman. Welcome back to Infinite Rabbit Hole. Welcome back to the Infinite Rabbit Hole, everybody. My name is Jeremy. I'm your host today. I am joined by my three beloved co-hosts, Jeffrey, Jacob, and Kenzar, the kid. Kenzar, we'll start with you today. How are you? I'm all right. It was a long day. Very long yeah. day. Yeah. How's the new job? Fantastic. Loving my new job, actually. Good, good. Yeah. Uh, I'm exhausted because they make me do everything, but I love it. It's cool. <laughs> it's, because, it's because you're the new kid. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yep. You get it from two sides. That's okay. <laughs> Jacob, I heard that you've been awake for a while. I have been uh, for a while. Yes. You look slightly exhausted. Yeah, no, I had watched this morning, and uh, I've been battling mosquitoes all day. It is now mosquito season in Southern California, and I mean, they'll pick your kids up and fly away with them. And w the military base I live on has a huge marsh that's like a protected area, and so they're can they can't spray for the mosquitoes because... This is like a natural habitat sanctuary thing for like 75% of the base. So it's just rampant mosquitoes 24-7 for like six months, and they just destroy everything. So you're like going out to get something out of your car real quick, come back in, you get 10 bites, just attack you, and it's they descend on you from hell where they come from. It's awful. Uh, like little pteranodon mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Moving, moving on. <laughs> Jeffrey, you look smart today. Thank you. I'm not, but I I do look. You've smart. already made I, that joke. You I look bald today. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I am Matt. That I yes. Am. Yeah, that sucks about the mosquitoes, man. I feel your pain down here in Florida. Uh, as we all know, Bill Gates put out a bunch of GMO mosquitoes, so that's always fun. They actually will pick your kids up and take them away. So watch out for the Bill Gates mosquitoes. But no, I'm good, man. I am. Uh, <laughs> stoked to talk about some smithsonian shenanigans it's my favorite and we will we will definitely get into that um for sure i just want to stress um the minnesota iceman is a it's a questionable topic because the official narrative on it is that it's a hoax that is the official narrative. And I just wanted to start today by kind of jumping into 
some samples from a few different websites and their articles, right? It just took small blurps from three large websites, right? That just did an article or had something posted on the Minnesota Iceman. And just to get kind of give everybody listening today the idea of where the exact narrative is regarding this creature. Hey, travelers. Let us take this opportunity to thank everyone for watching the Infinite Rabbit Hole. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. And click on the bell so you can be notified every time a new video goes up. Now, back to the Infinite Rabbit Hole. Uh, so, first, Wikipedia. Yes, the most accurate information in the internet factually comes from wikipedia and this is quoted as the very first thing on their minnesota iceman page quote the minnesota iceman is a sideshow exhibit and elaborate hoax that depicts a fake man-like creature frozen in a block of ice it was displayed at shopping malls state fairs and carnivals in the united states and canada in the 1960s and early 70s and promoted as the quote-unquote missing link between man and neanderthals it was sold on eBay in 2013 and put on display in Austin, Texas. Then we move on to Scientific American. Um, this one has a better reputation than Wikipedia, but it has also been very narrative driven as well. And that is brought to you by this quote. Quote, the skeptical view of the Minnesota Iceman has always been that it was a hoax. The latest in a long tradition of displaying enigmatic enigmatic memorable sideshow exhibits that are implied to be real in 2013 what appears to be the original and genuine article was offered for sale online today the minnesota iceman is owned by steve bushy of the museum of the weird in austin texas and certainly looks identical to the specimen discussed and illustrated by wavelman and sanderson its hoaxed nature doesn't exactly leave wavelman or Sanderson looking all that credible as scientists. Now, if you are familiar with the scientific side of Bigfoot, you will know both Wavelman and Sanderson as they are often talked about in books, documentaries, TV shows, anything having to do with Bigfoot. These two gentlemen are talked about quite a bit. Wavelman on one side is very, very respected uh, not only in cryptozoology, but also biology, um, anthropology, uh, primatology. There's a lot of different ologies that Wavelman is very uh, popular in. And Sanderson, although he was a little looser and more of a um, reckless uh, scientist, he was a scientist nonetheless and was one of the original um biologist slash zoologist that was made popular by showing up on shows such as the tonight show with johnny carson you know the 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 tv shows where uh these zoologists bring animals onto shows this was ivan and ivan t sanderson that was him he was one of the original zoologists to do that uh so immediately you can see that there's shots by the quote-unquote mainstream science um platforms and uh, Scientific America is definitely one of the big names. And uh, before we move on with the rest of the presentation, um, I'm going to go ahead and go across the sea to the Daily Mail from England, uh, where they quote, when the Smithsonian assessed the Iceman after Hansen said he switched it with a dummy, the museum stated it was quote, satisfied that the creature is simply a carnival exhibit made of latex rubber and hair, the quote unquote original model and the presented so-called quote substitute are one of the same, according to the quote unquote Bigfoot exposed investigators with the Smithsonian also discovered a company on the West Coast made Hansen an Iceman in 1967, but whether or not it was just a replica of the real Iceman, the company Hansen commissioned to make the dummy never saw an original. So uh, that is the official narrative. And I know that we're, I kind of dumped a whole bunch of information that a lot of people aren't familiar with, but 
as we make it through these two presentations, because this will be a two parter, uh, part two will be coming sometime in the future, not next week. Next week is our 100th episode. Congratulations, everybody. Silent claps, silent claps. Thanks. I was muted. Sorry. Yeah, I know. Everyone was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, let me fix that. Yeah. yeah Jeffrey, <laughs> just, <laughs> just sit there and do nothing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're such a fucking nice guy. Okay. Oh, snaps. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Anyways, so that makes this episode 99. And how else would I ever want to sandwich our 100th episode than by Bigfoot? Beating on your microphone. Beating on my microphone. But yes, I am sandwiching episode 100 with um, a story that I think is extremely undervalued in the realm of Bigfoot. And I believe needs way more attention than it has and um i'm gonna prove that to you guys this is actually one of the few topics that i have ever brought to the table in infinite rabbit hole where i'm actually going to attempt to prove to everybody that something needs more attention and not just simply give you the facts this is something that i am debating on the side of this was an actual creature now at the end of episode one you know it's mostly an information dump where you guys are going to get a ton of information um but at the end of episode two i believe that everybody will be on my side all right copy that let's move (laughs) on (laughs) does anybody have any questions before we move on no sir all right so i thought the ice man was something completely different so now i looked it up while you were talking about it i was like oh what's this so already I'm intrigued, although it does look very fake. So, OK, yeah. we'll get into that. I got <laughs> you, dude. I got you. All right. So All right. first, let's talk about the findings of Wayman and Sanderson. So they studied the ice aged man. This is what it was. It was originally referred to as the ice aged man uh, for three days. During this time, they made an observation that someone who was not tra- or they made observations that someone who was not trained in practices of primatology and or anthropology would easily overlook. The specimen was obviously an adult male. Not much to overlook there. Covered in long brown hair from head to toe with large hands and feet. The only places that dense hair seemed to not be was around the face and chest, which had much less hair. Even the top of the feet were covered in hair, which is not a trait observed in anthropoid apes, which have typically naked feet. And the fact, uh, in fact, the incredible features of the feet don't stop there. Unlike humans who have toes at the end of their feet and pointed in a straight line, the Iceman had toes that fanned out and are built more for grabbing and climbing on rocky surfaces than for running in a straight line like ours. In Wavelman's book, Neanderthal, The Strange Saga of the Minnesota Iceman, he mentions many other very interesting features about the man in ice, such as the head was set deep into its shoulders, which is a common feature spotted in many Bigfoot sightings. In fact, his neck and throat seem to be swollen due to a possible goiter or the presence of of a vocal sac commonly found in other primates. The chest cavity seemed to be much larger than that of a human, which is another common feature described by Bigfoot witnesses, and the arms seemed to hang much lower than that of a normal human, with its hands sitting closer to the kneecaps and the legs were shorter in scale than compared to human. The man obviously died from a wound to one of his eyes, which looked very much like a hole from bullet, which caused the eye to hang below the damaged eye hole and its left arm clearly suffered a large compound fracture, which the men originally assumed was caused by whoever put put him into the freezer uh, that it currently sat in, so probably something along the lines of breaking his arm in order to make it fit. Parts of the ice were non-transparent, which left some areas of the body completely unviewable. Quavelman believed this was due to crystallization from gases and moisture escaping the dead body and refrozen. Another obvious reason for very little visibility in certain places was the blood. Blood seemed to be present in many areas around the body, especially around the eyes and the broken forearm. But for the most part, the Iceman was clearly visible and in 
a great preserved state. During the study of the Iceman, Quavelman noticed that the right foot seemed to be one of the best pieces of evidence that this creature was in fact flesh and blood, and not a cheap trick. One of the toes was a deep shade of gray, and the shape of the leg convinced him that whoever the Iceman was, he certainly lived with a physical disability most likely from an injury. It seemed to be a dead limb, and possibly gangrenous before the man's death. This showed a clear biological reaction to an injury, which many counterfeiters would not even think to add to their creation. The putrid smell of death hung in the air of the refrigerated trailer due to a piece of the frozen man's flesh being exposed from the melting ice and a broken gasket. The smell seemed to be escaping from a broken corner gasket. There it is. And it was the smell that set the famed mystery of the Minnesota Iceman into the cryptozoology history books to be talked about for years to come as both well-respected men agreed that what they were looking at was indeed the frozen body of a real biological ancient man. Thoughts and opinions so far, gentlemen and lady. Um... I mean, not really, I guess. I mean, it's, the description makes it sound like it could be real, but uh, I'm kind of, I don't know. I'm looking at pictures of it as you're talking, and mm -hmm. I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm definitely curious to see what else you got to say about this. I got you. So are the pictures of the quote-unquote, like, spare one that was created, or are the pictures real of, like, the real one that was discovered? So, because this one looks crazy fake, but if it's the spare, the rubber one with the hair attached to it and stuff, then it would make sense why it looks so fake. So there is only one known set of photos of the original biological one, and that is because okay. of the the room inside of the trailer and the cameras that they had in the 60s. Zoom wasn't necessarily a thing. Wide, wide angle ranges wasn't something that was commonly owned by the public so the whole body of the creature was actually taken in four smaller photos and those that are uh watching in on the paranormal network i'm going to show you the the front of bernard huevelman's book right this is if you look on google and you see anything like this you can clearly see the broken pieces of the photo here okay this is the only set of photos known to be taken of the what is referred to as the bio, biological version of the Iceman. Now, all the other photos that have been taken, you can see that they're fully made, and that's because this thing was taken out of the refrigerated trailer, uh, out of the esophagus, or the chest freezer, coffin, whatever you want to call it, and was able to be taken from a, a greater distance. So... Uh, does that kind of clear that up for you? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so 99% of the pictures that are out there are thought to be of the, the fake one. And that is where the, the, the big controversy kind of happens here is this flip flop between the original specimen, the biological specimen and the fake one. Unfortunately, we're not going to get too deep into that until part two. Uh, where I really break that down, but trust me, there's a lot more to this, and we have just been, we have just gotten started. So, are you guys ready? How uh, how tall was the thing, or how, yeah, from feet to head, like? So I don't know. <gasps> uh, um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but in a referenced, he uh, okay, Waveman referenced the size of a typical five foot 10 gorilla in the book, which I also talk about in part two. Um, and the average size of a five foot 10 human. So by that, by that standards alone, I'm thinking it was roughly around the same size as he used that reference in height uh, to compare the weight possibility of this creature and the weight of the block of ice. Um, again, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but as far as I know, it was roughly 5'10". 
I can look that up though and get you a, a more solid answer. Did it have uh, a mid tarsal break? You uh, could not tell. <sighs> I know, man. Well, then I guess it's fake. <laughs> I know. And it, there's, and this is one of those things that just will never be answered. You know, because uh, they're saying spoiler. something like what, a vocal sac or something like that, something reminiscent of other of their primates or apes or whatever. So, so if then, you if you look at the original photos, the ones that are that are mm -hmm. uh, in the four pieces, you can kind of see like this bulging around, like a goiter kind of thing. Right. But if you look and you just Google vocal sacs and primates, vocal sac, um, yeah. it is a very large. Uh, man, I'm trying to be appropriate with this. Sack, right? <laughs> skin sack, yeah. <laughs> some some sort of skin sack that is also seen on other parts of uh, males, uh, various male. You mean animalia. like howling, howler apes and stuff? So they yes. stand yes. kind of like a frog, and it allows yes. them to make those weird bellowing sounds and stuff to attract a mate. So it had yes. something like that. Yes. Okay. So yeah, again, that leads me into like, well, if it had a mid tarsal break. That would be another thing that maybe a, a hoaxer wouldn't have thought of. Right. You know, but certainly the, the detailed description that you just gave of like all of the, the damage and stuff, the, the blood that was, uh, you know, congealed in certain areas, like around the forearm break. I mean, that's, you know, people are like, why, you know, I broke my arm. Why is it so gross and purple and black and all that stuff? It's because of the bruising, because of the blood, like getting right in that area right and so that's right. something that you know if i was going to make a prop and freeze it in a block of ice i would never think to do something like that i would never go so deep into you know making it as real as possible because i would just assume i mean you could just you know yeah do the baseline and people are going to be like oh my gosh <laughs> you know so that's one, of the, one, one of the main reasons here that this is so easily played off as a hoax is because so little evidence actually exists of this, right? Um, look at it this way. You're walking into the back of a trailer, like a truck, you know, with a big box truck, right? A yeah. refrigerated box truck. How much room is there in there? I mean, not too much. And you put a big old uh, chest freezer right in the middle with all the refrigerated units around it and stuff. There's not a lot of room. Not to mention the sides of this chest freezer were not transparent, only the top. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, there there are sketches of, you know, filling in the blanks, people attempting to, at least, of how the feet were uh, positioned and everything. And the best thing we can get is like an artist rendition, sort of like how... Mm -hmm. uh, pictures of space are right so uh <laughs> just on a different scale we're talking about a bigfoot feet than uh rather than planets but uh that's kind of what we're working on there but trust me i've got much better evidence here uh and i really can't wait to get part two but i've got some some really good stuff here in part one too i like your description of the chest freezer it's reminding me of like a uh like a slide over cooler like you'd find in a grocery store and like where you get like frozen shrimp from you just slide open one side of it and then pull your whatever item out or slide the other door <laughs> like that's what i'm picturing right now and they had a that's, that's literally what it was <laughs> it was it had a, a glass pane on top yeah so it you know you it wasn't just you looking down at a block of ice you had to look through glass to the block of ice um with a so, stinky foot hanging out <laughs> um all right let me let me get going we're already 25 right. minutes in so let's let's roll um so huevelman's report in sanderson's article the following is bernard huevelman's description of the ice aged man in the bulletin of royal institute of natural sciences of belgium so i did this i quoted both of these articles word for word uh, to keep them in their original forms so you can hear the words that these two scientific men put into both uh, scientific journals and articles. Uh, Huevelman quoted, is quoted, the specimen at first look, at first looks like a man, or if you prefer, an adult human being of the male sex, of rather normal height, ah, six feet, there it is, and proportions, but excessively hairy. It is entirely covered with dark, 
brown hair, three to four inches long. Its skin appears wax-like, similar in color to the cadavers of white men, not tanned by the sun. The specimen is lying on its back. The left arm is twisted behind the head with the palm of the hand upward. The arm makes a strange curve as if there were as if it were that of a sawdust doll, but this curvature is due to an open fracture midway between the wrist and the elbow, where one can distinguish the broken ulna in a gaping wound. The right arm is twisted and held tightly against the flank, with the hand spread palm down over the right side of the abdomen. Between the right finger and the medius, the penis is visible, Lying obliquely on the groin, the testicles are vaguely distinguishable at the juncture of the thighs. Sanderson would go on to nickname this frozen ice-aged man Bozo. <laughs> and in the May 1969 issue of Argosy, Sanderson would have an article about the man published which read, quote, Bozo's face is his most startling feature both to anthropologists and anyone else, and for several reasons. Unfortunately, both eyeballs have been, quote-unquote, blown out of their sockets. One appears to be missing, but the other seems to at least to be just visible under the ice. This give bo gives Bozo a gruesome appearance, which is enhanced by a considerable amount of blood diffused from the sockets through the ice. The most arresting feature of the face is the nose. This is large, but only fairly wide, and is distinct distinctly pugged like the Pekingese dog, but not like that of a gorilla, which actually doesn't have a nose per se. The nostrils are large, circular, and point straight forward, which is very odd. The mouth is only fairly wide, and there is no eversion of the lips at all. This muzzle is not more bulging, prominent, or pushed forward than is our own, not at all prognathous like that of a chimp. One side of the mouth is slightly agape, and two small teeth can be seen. These should be the right upper canine and the first premolar. The canine or eye tooth is very small and in no way exaggerated into a tusk, or is similar to that of a gorilla or chimp. But, to me at least, the most interesting features of all are some folds and wrinkle lines around the mouth just below the cheeks. These are absolutely human and are like those seen in a heavy-jawed older white man. Both men went on to mention the Ice Age man on very public forums. Sanderson, who is very well known who was a very well-known nature personality of television, talked about the discovery on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson during the week of Christmas of 1968. Wavelman went as far as to write an entire scientific paper about the ice-aged man and would officially name it via taxonomic classification as Homo pongoids instead of the name previously used by Sanderson that mimicked the country's most famous clown. What do you guys think? Scientific papers. Yeah, I mean, I don't put much weight into scientific papers. I'm sure most people I listening to this don't. know, <laughs> uh, you know, trust the science and all. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. It sound the descriptions sound quite thorough. So I'm gonna kind of walk back what I said in the first little bit and say that maybe it is a real thing, especially since now I'm thinking that the mainstream narrative is that it's a hoax. And of course I have to be contra con I have to be contradictory to the mainstream narrative because that's my thing. So I'm going to lean a little bit more on your side so far. Uh, if you're already leaning my side, I'm going to do nothing more than just throw you over my head. and You're going to be farther on my side than I am. All right. I'm ready for it. <laughs> Kid, so, anything? Yeah. Go Kenzer. I go got Kenzer. nothing. I'm go just. I'm... All right. Moving on. Hey, Jake. Anything? <laughs> so, and I'm sure you're going to get into it and stuff, but you've already mentioned that the reason why it's said so much so that it's a hoax is because of the lack of evidence <clears throat> and you know everything around it that it appears 
from just where we're at right now, that besides these two, you know, these two scientists digging into it and saying what they observed and all that sort of stuff, and then the very few pictures of it, I think with the current, and it's not even so current, but this this theory of evolution being pushed so hard as if it's truth with very little evidence to actually back up any of the claims, this thing would be stuffed and hung in front of the Smithsonian Museum to display to everybody, this is the missing link. So mm-hmm. I, I, I have a hard time thinking for a second that this is so human-like that, oh my gosh, this is one of our ancestors versus that this is, you know, I'm still on the side of this could be real, but it would be something else. It would be a, not a descendant, but a, you know, Bigfoot or mm-hmm. something, right? Some Something that would give some kind of a reason that it would go missing or, you know, the evidence would be lost or something like that, some sort of nefarious purpose around it because it couldn't be this, you know, missing link because otherwise like i said without you know repeating the entire thing like it would be the pinnacle of you know science today being like the ice man there it is <laughs> right there there is the link you know and it, it would just it just isn't right so that would lead me to believe that it's not that but it, it could still be real just not that right so that's kind of where i'm sitting right now i wish yeah. i had a page dog-eared for you because somebody, I can't remember their name, was quoted in saying that this needs to be looked at much further uh, because, oh, right here. Uh, Although America at the time was still gloating with legitimate pride of having put an astronaut on the moon a year before, Andre Kapar had not hesitated in his letter to affirm the comparable importance of homo pongoids, quote, you have there a subject as worthy as reaching the moon, end quote. And to kind of give you an idea of who this Andre Kapar was, this was the director of the Antwerp Zoo. Um, oh, no, he was Professor and Andre Kapar. Um, sorry, he was not the director of the Antwerp Zoo. That was Walter Van de Berg. Um, so I don't have that on me right now i'd have to look i'd have to read through it a little bit more but that was Mm -hmm. quoted uh he was somebody of of very importance um i know he was a professor of what oh it looks like the royal the sciences naturals de bel oh belgium um -hmm. so he was some sort of uh professor of a royal institute Oh, the the Royal Institute of Natural Sciences in Belgium. Mm-hmm. That's who so it was. I, I mean, it, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it's just it wouldn't be these like tiny little chips of molars that they build an entire skull around, and they're like, "This is what our ancestors looked like." They would just right. take this thing and hang it in front of the Smithsonian Museum and be like, "There it is," you know. <laughs> but change my mind not... again. I changed my mind again. <laughs> Jake, Jake has just made a very good point, and then I back that up 100%. This would have been put right at the front door of the Smithsonian. And on top of that, the guy who said that this is an important find as part of some royal society uh, institution, no, no, no. I'm changing my mind again. This thing was fake. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, and that's and for me, that's not to say that it, it wasn't real. But if we're going along these lines that, the smithsonian or some organization or multiple organizations are covering up the existence of sasquatch when there's so much evidence to back up that they do exist then for me this would be in the same category of stuff this is a one of those 10 types that you you looked at maybe this is the 11th type or something along the lines of that or maybe it's a juvenile you know who knows um but that it was evidence was just dumped off or you know the body just went missing and oh who can tell if what pictures this is if it's the real one or the fake one or whatever it is um because yeah i mean there might be some sort of reason why this is being covered up and hidden um whatever that may be genetic experimentation whatever you know pick your uh, conspiracy but i'm not saying that this is fake but i don't think that it's you know 
this like massive scientific discovery like the evidence that the theory of evolution has been seeking for the entire time it's been mm-hmm. around right so right that's where i'm at right now anything else good topic jeremy good good topic all right let's keep going let's fight <laughs> let's talk about it let's talk about when it just disappeared <gasps> at some point the original carcass was replaced with a model that was claimed to have been provided to hansen by many different hollywood costume artists so how do we know that there was a switch of the body well in lauren coleman's book bigfoot the true story of apes in america coleman stated that the original photos that were taken by terry colin ivan t sanderson and Bernard Huebelman in 1968 were compared to ones taken by Lauren Coleman at the Illinois State Fair in 1969 and others taken by Mark A. Hall also in 1969. It was Sanderson and Huebelman's that pointed out 15 differences by the pictures alone that proves that what was now being displayed was no longer the original corpse. But what happened to the original? According to Frank Hansen, As time went on, he began expanding the area that the attraction would be shown at. He began taking many trips into southern Canada to show off the mysterious Ice Age man. But during one of his crossings over the border, Hansen claims that the customs agents would not allow him to cross over to the United States with a corpse without the written permission by the U.S. Surgeon General. This claim has been verified, by the way. Hansen continuously claimed that the exhibition was of a monkey suit filled with sawdust, but the border agents were demanding a tissue sample to provide to prove his claims. This, of course, was refused by Hansen as well as the alternative option of an X-ray. During the holding period at the Canadian border, Hansen made calls to who he claimed to be the true owner of the exhibit, in California, who apparently contacted Minnesota's Attorney General at the time, Walter Frederick Mondale, which eventually led to him being able to re-enter into the U.S. with the exhibit untouched. After he was allowed over the border and back into Minnesota, he received a visit from the FBI at his house shortly after. This is when a lot of people believe that the real switch happened. That's just a side note there. This is kind of where a lot of the conspiracy takes place. Uh, One of the major uh, flows or conspiracy uh, ideas is that this right here, when the FBI showed up at Hanson's house, is when the original went missing. But to get back on track, at this time, Then Secretary of the Smithsonian, S. Dylan Ripley, began trying to relocate the original after this subject was brought to his attention by then Smithsonian anthropologist John Napier. It was when the Smithsonian began to get involved with that Hansen would admit that the real story behind the Minnesota Iceman was that it was really owned by a millionaire in Hollywood, California, and that he refused to have any further studies done on the creature. It was after this hurdle was thrown at the Smithsonian that Ripley would write to the head of the FBI, a Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, in which Ripley asked for his involvement in locating the body. Hoover declined his request, and the search for Bozo was officially over. Is this Ripley like Ripley's Believe or Not? No. Oh, I I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Why is John Napier, why does that sound so familiar? He is a big name in Bigfoot studies. And uh, I believe he passed away just a little while ago, but he is you'll see him on documentaries for Bigfoot and stuff. He he was definitely an older gentleman uh, as of recently. Um, uh, I'm actually going to look up a picture of him right now and make sure I'm thinking of the right guy. Um, He also seems to have put out a couple bigfoot books as well yeah okay that is who i'm thinking it is um yeah he he has been in a couple tv shows uh i believe he was even on monster quest as as somebody that they brought on to talk about bigfoot i could be wrong there uh but i know that he was definitely on some shows and some uh documentaries as well regarding bigfoot so is there any uh verifiable proof that it was that it was the fbi that showed up 
Uh, yes, absolutely there is. Do I have it on hand right now? Uh, no, I might have it in my notes here just to kind of let everybody know why I'm not exactly on on the ball today. I was not ready to give this presentation today. This was supposed to be a different episode, but somebody backed out on us, which is fine. Anyways, um, so I don't have all the answers ready for you guys. I wasn't 100% ready for this, but I am doing my best. Ooh. But I I I can there get the references fired for there. <laughs> there was no shots fired there. <laughs> um I can get the references for you. Uh this was verified through a couple different sources of mine. Uh and of course I did see the references. I always check references, uh, even if they're in books. Um I'm sure the reference that I'm looking for is somewhere in this t- 10 pages. Well, of the only, references. the only reason I asked that question is just because I'm sure everybody listening, you know, has the same thought as mm-hmm. me when it comes to intelligence agencies, you know, they, they do funny things. Right. So like, I was just thinking like, how do we know it was the FBI and it wasn't some other alphabet agency just posing as the FBI or whatever. But if, you know, if it's verified, it was it, whatever, it doesn't matter, I guess. But That is interesting that the Alphabet Soup boys would show up. And, I mean, it's interesting that they would show up, period. Mm -hmm. Let alone, like, oh, this is where people think that the body went missing or whatever the case is. That, too. But just the fact that the Alphabet Soup boys showed up for something like this, red flag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the moment I heard... FBI, I was like, well, there's definitely something here that uh, they wanted covered up. Because the FBI doesn't give real. two craps about like no, like new animal discoveries. <laughs> like, why would they no. care about this? Exactly. Right. Yeah. And that, for me, I'm leaning more towards this thing. This entire thing is real. Maybe you said this, and I just didn't catch it. But was this thing ever dated? Like, how old it is? We're gonna get into that. Okay, so you didn't say it. I'm not. And I'm not. Not yet. I mean, it wasn't ever officially dated. Uh, you know, to kind of jump ahead just a little bit and not give too much away. Uh, there was never permission given to anybody to take materials away from the Iceman, no matter whether it was the fake one or what was considered to be the real one. Never, mm. never. Hansen never let anybody take anything what's this Hanson guy's name again i want to look up his background a little bit his name and what's his social <laughs> mom's maiden name seven four <laughs> um frank hansen and i do do a background on him too so just hang tight dude okay. i already got it all here for you we'll we'll jump into it all together but it's no yeah fun. so i agree that either either the proof of its reality is that the alphabet soup shows up or the whole thing is a hoax for some reason the alphabet soup decides to show up to just make another layer to the hoax Mm -hmm. or it's a um was it a distraction away from something else i don't know there's so many layers right now it's like an onion it's like shrek it gets even crazier. <laughs> it gets even crazier, man. I'm telling you, this goes absolutely wild. Like by, by the end of by the end of part two, I wish we could do part two because, like, I want to like jump out and just say a whole bunch of stuff that I'm saving for part two. Um, I'm just telling anybody that has any kind of sort of interest and thinks that this topic is very interesting, you want to be here for part two. That's all I gotta say. And the show's free, so there's no reason why you shouldn't be here for part two. <laughs> All right. We're 45 minutes in, and I am on page four of 11. So All let's, right. let's roll. Well, um, part four when the information comes out. <laughs> nope, we're doing this in two parts. Anyways, <laughs> what was it? Bernard Huevelman stated in his journal entry in the Bulletin of the Royal Institute of Natural Sciences of Belgium that he believed that what he called homopongoids was in fact a new form of living Neanderthal. 
He famously wrote about how it was his belief that the Minnesota Iceman was the evidence that for the first time in modern history, a quote, fresh corpse of Neanderthal like man was found and that it meant that this form of man, man long thought to be extinct is still roaming the earth to this day. It was his belief that the quote unquote missing link had been found. Ivan T. Sanderson disagreed with his good friend and publicly stated that he believed that the Minnesota Iceman should not be categorized as part of the Neanderthal race. He believed that it should belong to an older hominid referred to as Pithocanthropus or Homo erectus. But many peers across the scientific community agreed with Playwoman and some such as the French-Spanish zoologist Jordi McGrainer believed that it was the body of of a relative to the Baramanu or a Baramanu itself. The Baramanu is a northern Pakistan and Afghanistan upright walking hairy hominid that is thought to be a lost and solitary tribe of Neanderthal or Sasquatch esque creatures. Magrainer, or Magrainer, came to his conclusion after showing witnesses of the Baramanu a lineup of possible subjects by pictures he laid out. All 50-plus witnesses pointed to the pictures taken by Huevelman of the Minnesota Iceman as their Baramanu. But, as stated by Lauren Coleman in his book, Bigfoot, The True Story of Apes in America, this doesn't prove that the Iceman or the Baramanu is a Neanderthal, just that the Iceman and the Baramanu look like each other. But, just because many sided with Huevelman, doesn't mean there weren't a few out there that had their own theories. One being that of Mark A. Hall, who believed that the Minnesota Iceman was more along the lines of the well-documented Homo erectus. Dr. W.C. Osmond Hill believed it looked more ponged than hominid, and Dr. John Napier, leader of the primate biology program at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. at the time, believed that it didn't belong to either family, and they should, quote, create a new family for it rather than try to force it into one of the older ones. Dr. John Napier would eventually be the connection that launched the Smithsonian's interest into the Iceman, which many believe to be the reason why the FBI got involved and the reason why the original body was replaced with a fabricated one. Say your things, but make it quick. Go. Go ahead, boys and girl. Definitely Bigfoot, or something along the lines of it. Nice. That was to yes. the point. Thank you, Jacob. Mm. Good. That was even more to the point. Thank you, Kenzo. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Good. I'm going to make up some time here and jump right into the next one. All right. Where did it come from? Wave Woman not only had an idea of what the Minnesota Iceman was, but also how it got to where it was when he viewed it in the back of a refrigerator a refrigerated trailer in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He originally theorized that the Neanderthal that was trapped in a block of ice was originally from Vietnam and was likely killed during the war that spanned 20 years from 1955 to 1975. The body was likely smuggled into the States by way of military aircraft in a body bag as a dead soldier. But of course, Frank Hansen had his own origin story as well. He told the story of how he shot the creature on a hunting trip in 1960 at the White Face Reservoir at Aurora, Minnesota. This would fall in line with another well-known creature of the North America, of North America, Bigfoot. More on this in part two, by the way. We expand greatly into this in part two. But the origin stories didn't stop there. During Terry Cullen's initial conversation with Ivan T. Sanderson, he claimed that the story being told by Hansen during the exhibition was that the block of ice was found floating in the Bering Sea off the coast of the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia by a Soviet trawler. Originally thought of to be a frozen seal, the chunk of ice was set aside until the thawing revealed the simian features of the creature inside. After making an emergency port stop in China, the block of ice was confiscated by the Chinese authorities. The ice block and its contents were then auctioned off to an anonymous wealthy man from California who paid Hansen 
handsomely to travel around and make money off of the creatures like this. And of course, there is a story that Hansen had told Ivan Sanderson and Bernard Huevelman the first time they visited the Minnesota Iceman exhibit at Hansen's home. There, he told the two men that he had purchased it in Hong Kong after it was fished up by Japanese whalers. It was his unnamed rich partner from Hollywood who had given Hansen the money to buy the ice block and the expenses needed to ship it back to America where they could exploit it for their mutual benefit. According to Hansen at this time, it was, in fact, this unnamed wealthy partner of his who was the real owner of the Iceman. Okay. Nope. Me first. I'm calling <laughs> Bologna. Call him baloney on this. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, for sure. Too many, too many different stories. Mm-hmm. Okay. You got Frank saying that he shot the thing. You got, you got, I mean, dude, there's just too many origin stories. Okay. Right, right, right. And then never, never mind the fact that the Chinese are literally in the business of creating hoaxes. We went over this in the dinosaur episode. Yep. Right. So, yeah, no, I'm not buying it. Okay. I'm not buying it. Ken, sir. <laughs> I'm kind of 50 50 here. Um, Jeff's right. There's way too many origin stories happening at once for this to all make complete sense. But I don't know. I don't know. I'm very 50 50 right now. Okay. So I don't buy the body bag flying in the plane thing um, because of the state of it and its level of decay when it was just you know being observed in the block of ice um it does not take very long for a dead body to you know get rigor mortis which is a couple hours and then bloat and then start to decay it gets real bad real quick and i don't know if people have ever seen how service members are transported but they're transported in caskets right Mm -hmm. whether they're wooden caskets or it's a single person and they're in a you know a real you know Like you're going to bury them in the ground casket Um, and certainly not in a body bag. And they could not be preserving this thing over that trip because, you know, a block of ice, it's not like it weighs the same amount as a dead person, right? (laughs) It's like this casket is filled with ice with a body inside of it. They're going to notice an extra few hundred pounds added to this thing, right? So they're going to be like, what the hell is this? This isn't, you know, this isn't a body, right? And then it's going to get discovered. So I, I'm not buying that. Whatever. Um, the you can just punch a ho- a small hole into that. All right, go for it. All right. So during Vietnam and Korea, there were so many dead bodies that they actually did have to use body bags. That's it. No, no, no. I'm not saying that there wasn't body bags being utilized, mm-hmm. but it wasn't filled with ice. Right. And it wasn't a box that was filled with ice either. What if Hansen knew the pilot? So what? What if Hansen was the pilot? So what? All the soldiers that were helping load the people on there weren't like, what the heck is this? This weighs 600 pounds. This weighs <laughs> 2,000 pounds. You know, it's like, <laughs> like oh, yeah, we, a big block we, of ice, you know? We had to throw three of them in there. Right. <laughs> we, had, we ran out of body this bags. 1,500 pounds. That's what know? I was going to say. We, we, we started doubling up on the body bags. Here, yeah. Okay? yeah. We're just There's... stuffing as much as possible inside of these things. There's empty but bags right there. What are you talking about? Scooters. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so <laughs> very morbid. Anyway, so moving on. <laughs> the block of ice floating, would you say, in the Bering Sea? Yes. That one I could buy. No. Very, let's, let, hear me out. Very recently, <laughs> there was a uh, an extinct, I believe, a cave bear discovered in Siberia. Frozen. Yeah, yeah, but frozen inside of like a wall, right? One of the most intact cave bear specimens ever discovered. Um, and I believe that same things has happened with mammoths, right? So, gosh, now, I can't wait to get farther floating into Floating in the ocean, yeah, maybe not, right? Not, I, whatever. But say, I don't know, maybe say it was on an ice wall and then it yeah. broke off and went into the water. And as it's melting and traveling, somebody picks it up. That one sounds more realistic to me than at least the airplane full of body bags and no one's going to know to say, you know, a, a 12-ton block of ice and be like, yeah, this is normal, you know, <laughs> throw it in the back. Um, <laughs> just keep adding weight to it. 
All right. <laughs> Let me keep going because I think it's in like five more sections. It get it comes back to this and it, it, it gets really good, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> I love the conversation. I underestimated the amount of conversation that we would have 100, here. 100 ton block of ice. <laughs> Um, an aircraft well, carrier. So let's keep going. Book. Let's keep going so we can try to keep this episode under two hours. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> um, Hansen is fishy. At the time of Sanderson and Huebelman's first visit to the exhibition of the Minnesota Iceman, Hansen was in his 40s. He was a retired former pilot for the U.S. Air Force with 20 years of active service. During his time as a pilot in the Air Force, he spent many years commuting from America to various Oriental countries, including participation in both the Korean and Vietnam Wars. So what is wrong with this Hansen guy and why does he act so weird about the Iceman? Some believe that Hansen was a really sick man, and a common theory is that Hansen could have been displaying a dead human corpse dressed like an upright walking hominid that would make a man very scared and standoffish when pressured into scientific examination or authorities seizing said Iceman. Both could lead to murder, harboring, transporting a corpse across state and county line charges, and the least of his worries, fraud, for claiming that the corpse was of an Ice Age man when, in fact, it was just a modern murdered man and as for his military career and the possibility of his smuggling of the body happening during his time as a pilot this would have been punishable by court martial so he really had a lot to worry about when it came to scientific examination of the body i also find it important to state that in Wayman's book he stated that there that quote there was no mention at all in the records of U.S. Customs of the introduction of the hairy man into the United States. So it is safe to say that it was either smuggled here illegally or it was created, found, or killed here. Why is it called the Minnesota Iceman if it had to be smuggled here? It's just a name. It, so where did it come it, from? It, Minnesota, yeah, well, of course. What, what, well, what we're, does Minnesota have anything to do with this? Well, Hanson Hanson lived in Minnesota. Okay. His farmhouse was in Minnesota, where the raid happened was in Minnesota. Most of the places, like the small uh, strip mall venues and stuff, mm. were in Minnesota. Uh, the majority of it happened in Minnesota. In fact, the story of the story that Hanson gives of him killing this thing happened in minnesota too um but we'll dive deeper into that in the part two that's the one i really want to get into because it just goes crazy and so, it's really cool so yeah jeff go ahead yeah well i mean look dude we I, like i already said there's too many origin stories for this thing but just the two right off the top of my head on one hand frank says that he shot the thing in minnesota on the other hand he says that some dude in california gave him money to buy the thing so mm -hmm. he has multiple origin stories mm -hmm. like him, him himself can't get his own story straight right but so, what what does that bullshit. lead you to believe about him himself is he okay up in his you know in his head or is he hiding something why why is he's there a multiple man. Is, he's is, a liar. He, is he a con man <laughs> is he a yeah. con man 100%. okay oh yeah i still think that your minds are going to be changed by the end of part two just Did he saying. also find a hole that he called Frank's hole, and it was this bottomless pit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jetson <laughs> Jets into Mel's hole. <laughs> Mel's hole. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, more curious action. So it gets even curiouser, Jeff. <laughs> oh, I love it. The Minnesota Iceman was surrounded with issues when it came to its authenticity. Most of these issues seem to come from Hansen himself. There was a time that Huevelman and Sanderson offered Hansen various amounts of money for the rights to the Iceman. Hansen would always take the value to the mysterious quote unquote real owner of the Iceman and come back with a no. The price apparently even went as high as a million dollars at one point and was still turned down. 
According to Hansen, the real owner of the Iceman valued owning something so rare that nobody else in the world owned one more than any amount of money. One day, after Sanderson and Wavelman had arrived at Hansen's place in Minnesota, Hansen had told them that his partner was furious that he had let them study the Iceman and that there would no longer be anyone allowed to study it ever again. This was, in fact, what happened shortly after. Another thing that happened during Sanderson and Wavelman's endeavors with the Iceman was the constant rejection of larger named scientists to join their ranks so that they can begin convincing areas of both government and the scientific communities to begin legal actions against Hansen and his mysterious partner in order to gain the corpse for scientific study. One particular example of this outlined in Whaleman's book, Neanderthal, The Strange Saga of the Minnesota Iceman, was the rejection of one of the most respected anthropologists of the time, Dr. Carlton S. Kuhn. In the same book, Whaleman's claims that Dr. Kuhn agreed with him on three things and quoted him saying, quote, I agree with you on three points. It is an authentic specimen. There is no doubt about it. It is something unknown to us and it is to be classified among hominids. But then quoted him also saying, quote, I say this between us, but I will not compromise myself by making a public statement. I already have enough trouble with my own work, end quote. Although soon after this conversation, Sanderson was given permission by Dr. Kuhn to quote his remarks on behalf of the Minnesota Iceman, Sanderson w went on to publish his initial thoughts on the subject and quoted Dr. Kuhn's thoughts in the May 1969 edition of Argosy. Within the magazine, Sanderson would include more quoted content from Kuhn that he hoped would help the current struggles of the topic. This would end up being the cover story for the edition of the magazine. I'm going to jump right into the next part uh, just because that one was pretty short. And this next one's going to be a little bit better to talk about. Uh, this one I titled You Win Some, You Lose Some. Wavelman eventually went on to submit a note to Dr. F. Tweezelman, head of the anthropolog anthropological section of the Royal Institute of Natural Science of Belgium. To Wavelman's surprise, the note was returned with a letter that included the amount of, quote, great interest. The Institute had, with the Iceman, and according to Huevelman's Dr. Twizelman, characterized the request as, quote, a model of critical analysis of a scientific problem. The Institute then went on to publish Huevelman's note within the same month with access to only those with scientific credentials. The only thing that Huevelman suggested requested of the institution was that the publication would stay out of the media for three months, meaning March of that year, to ensure that Sanderson can create a legal agreement with Hansen for the possession of the Iceman. As this was happening, Sanderson began attempting to persuade Hansen to allow him to take x-ray photos of the Iceman and ensure that it would be done with no evasiveness. But unfortunately, this was also denied by Hansen and created an argument between the two men. This led Sanderson to drop the ball about the article that Huevelman's was going to have published, which really pissed off Hansen. This would also be the last straw when it came to Sanderson and Huevelman working together on the Iceman, due to many differences in opinions and some rather risky and some may say unprofessional choices of actions by Sanderson the men split ways after this. Hansen had two different stories for why the body really went missing. One, the body was taken by the border patrol on the border of Canada. And two, the rich friend of his came and took it away and replaced it with a fake one. And of course, there was the common belief that the FBI had actually taken the original after the raid on Hansen's farm. No matter which one actually happened, it is thought that the news that Huevelman's article being released from an angry Sanderson was the reason that the Iceman disappeared. Either way, S. Dylan Ripley of the Smithsonian reached out directly to Hansen and requested permission for the Smithsonian to do their examinations on the corpse. Hansen replied that this was not going to happen because his partner had taken the original away and he left him with only a fabricated copy of the original. 
Hansen followed up by saying that it was his belief that the original would never be seen again. And he was right. Definitely a dead person. He got too much traction, too much attention. He freaked out, and he's like, I need to get rid of this. <laughs> Anything else? He, this guy's full of shit, dude. He can't, <laughs> he, can't, he can't pick a story and stick to it at all, whether it's the origin or the disappearance. This guy doesn't know how to keep his lies straight. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, man. I have a whole other, like, set of feelings about these schmucks that you know are part of the royal institutions and stuff mm-hmm. like that but you know yeah no, this guy's full of shit sorry well he's a con man who couldn't keep his story straight and got too many people involved I have that a, is what he is i have a theory what's that what is i don't know what it is off the top of my head but there's two Really, two brothers um, overseas that are very, very popular. Ripley, believe it or not, did a whole thing on them where they have some like abnormal hair growth. They grow hair all over their body and stuff. And people think that they're like, they've claimed that, you know, oh, these people are, are the missing link or they're werewolves or something like that because they but literally they, grow hair on every square they, inch of their body. But they suffer from lycanthropy. Is that what right? it is? I believe so, yeah. I, I mean, wh- whatever the, the hair disorder is called. But what if he was, in fact, overseas and he found somebody that was suffering from this and then killed them, then transported them overseas, and he had that story, and then people were like, whoa, you know, what are you doing transporting, like, dead remains of anything, you know? And he's like, oh, I mean, I I shot it here, and in order to stop the decay process, froze the body of this person in a block of ice. And then had these two scientists over and expecting it to just be a, you know, I'm only going to let them observe from a distance and they're going to write the report and then I'm going to get famous by viewing it. But it got too much traction. So he's like, I have to get rid of this, this person. Hmm. That has fewer holes than this, you know, bag of cats (laughs) that we're looking at right now. (laughs) It's called hypertrichosis, by the way. There you go. Okay. Um... That's my theory. I'm going to stick with this as a Bigfoot. But we'll Dang. Get... I'm I telling you. Sure, I thought I, for I, sure you'd be in the category of missing link or something. No, I think this is a Bigfoot. That I'm going to mm. go ahead and jump to my final thoughts already. Uh, halfway through the first episode and just say that this was a Bigfoot. And I'm just going to continue laying down the story. And by the end of the part two, I think you guys will be on board with me. If not, that's fine. I'm still Bigfoot. Are we still friends? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Anyways. I'm going to need three new hosts. <laughs> All right. You guys ready? Yep. Yeah. What was that? That was what? my headphones going. But I, I thought that there was something behind me. Mine did it sound too. Like, oh, Mine it sounded like there was well. something I like back was here. I looked me. back like the ghosts are back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought... I thought my cats were doing something out there, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> All right. Demons! Um, <laughs> Things start moving around in here. Okay. All right, so I think um, I think you guys are going to like this one. This one gets a little scientific. All right, so what do we know? We know that I like to hit my mic. In Bernard Huevelman's book, Neanderthal, The Strange Saga of the Minnesota Iceman, he lays out many different facts about the Iceman that a non-scientific mind would not think of. One thing that he explains is that whatever the Iceman was, it was not very old. Unfortunately, here on Earth, temperatures do not stay cold enough for long enough to allow for perfect preservation. He explains that fully intact corpses of mammoths, cave bears, and other long extinct animals have been found. Yes, but they are not found in pure ice as typically reported. In order for that type of preservation to occur, with the temperatures readily available here on Earth, the corpse must be surrounded by muck and rotten vegetation. As quoted from Huevelman, quote, because of the presence of bactericide acids like tannic or humic acid, this kind of peat 
has a tendency to prevent decomposition. The Minnesota Iceman was not surrounded by such materials, nor was there any evidence at some point that was the case. By Huevelman's understanding, the Iceman was only frozen for a few years at most. So whatever he was, it was modern. So we can eliminate the idea that this was a prehistoric man in any way, shape, or form. Another thing pointed out by Huevelman in Chapter 2 of his book is that due to the presence of bubbles in the ice, one can understand that this was not a natural freezing of a body. When a body is dead and frozen naturally, the freezing begins at the skin, which traps the gases and fluids in the cavities within the body. But when an unfrozen body is frozen in a man-made way, the freezing occurs from the outside of the container and moves inwards, allowing for bubbles that come off the body due to gases leaving during decomposition to be trapped within the ice. So this takes the likeliness that a ship of some sorts found a block of ice containing the creature at sea. Oh, this take this takes the likeliness away. So we could pretty much eliminate those stories as well. And yet another thing that we can possibly eliminate is that this was a natural death. Huevelman states that one of the reasons why he was so interested in spending the time to drive all the way to Minnesota from New Jersey was due to the fact that when Terry Colin had originally called him over the matter, he explained that he had been presented a chance to see the backside of the ice block. During this time, he saw that what looked like an exit wound from a gunshot in the back of its head. Huevelman's explained that when he witnesses when he witnessed the body or when he witnesses the body, one of the things that immediately stood out to him was that the right eyeball was missing and other and the other one was hanging out of the socket down by the Iceman's left cheek. Warning. Graphic contact explained next. Skip 30 seconds if you guys don't want to hear it. When a bullet passes through a skull, the immediate pressure that is built up within the skull cavity often forces the eyeballs to pop out of the sockets. Therefore, if this man was shot in the eye by almost any gun, especially the ones used for hunting, it would seem that the bullet entered through or near the right eye, creating an exit wound on the back of the head and pushing the left eyeball out of the socket as well as other matter of the head, which would explain the amount of very dark blood trapped in the ice near the head. But due to the lack of scarring on the right eye, it would seem that this hairy man was killed by a gunshot wound to the right eye sometime within the last few years, around 1967, of course, because that's when this whole thing went down, and thrown into a deep freezer while the body was still warm. Waveman stated in his book that he believed that the right leg was also hit by a bullet, causing the abnormality we had discussed earlier, most likely hitting its sciatic nerve, leaving the right leg immobilized, allowing for the capture of the man. Most likely, whoever had shot the creature had attempted to keep it alive, as the leg had become deformed and the toe had become gangrenous, meaning that whenever that leg was damaged or shot, the creature continued to live. Just wanted to point that out. And just like any captured and injured animal, the Iceman would have been rightfully pissed off. This is where the compound fracture to the arm might have come in, as the creature would have most likely have used his arms to protect itself from getting beaten by a club or metal bar that the capturer was using to force it into obedience. And of course, the arm could have been the first thing hit by the fatal bullet used as a way to finally subdue the unruly man-ape that, that proved unflinching to the world of modern man. Of course, the only way to verify this is through a thorough autopsy of the original corpse, which never happened, and unfortunately, never will. Mm. So he committed a murder and tried to cover it up. What he murdered, I don't know, but he murdered something. Okay. 
whether that be a Bigfoot or human with what with how did you say this hypertrichosis mm-hmm. um to me it just sounds right now it sounds like he committed a murder and tried to cover it up and con everybody and got too many people involved gentlemen uh i i i can go with that theory for sure um i'm still curious cuz i want to know more about this guy and like Hanson? what his yeah, I want to know more about what his background is because I have a couple of theories bouncing around in my head. We but do been... get a little bit a uh, slightly more into his character, especially during his service when we uh kind of touch base with somebody who worked with him in part two. Okay. I'm just gonna say one word. Mm-hmm. Chimeras. <laughs> <laughs> very well all right jake what do you got you know i'm so glad that you got into it and good good idea with the the graphic thing i'm going to talk about some graphic stuff too so if you don't want to listen to it just skip ahead um yeah so i'm into hunting and shooting sports and what i think that a lot of people don't understand is that when you see someone die in a movie right in hollywood they're not showing you what actually happens it's not some like little hole and then a little trickle out of the ear or something like that it's disgustingly graphic right Mm -hmm. like if you ever just look up youtube um ballistics gel you know or bullet ballistics and ballistic gel when the bullet goes in little itty bitty bullet you know they're not huge but they go in and you watch this gel like completely expand and create this cavity and then it comes back together and slams inside of a head that forces everything out right Mm -hmm. and so right before you said it and you said a gunshot wound to the back of the head the first thing i thought of is that's why the eyeballs are out mm-hmm. and just like just like that and i was just like so and it's such a detailed description like and the way that the person played it out and the, the you know and, yeah there you go waveman the way that he played it out and like the the gangrenous foot right that that mm-hmm. wouldn't happen if it was just you know bang in the foot or bang in the leg, bang in the head, or head leg, or whatever you know way that went, and somehow upon transport the 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 arm snapped or whatever it was, like none of those things would happen like that unless it was pretty much in the way he laid it out. Right. So if this thing was in fact a Bigfoot, I mean that you know investigation or that you know this is what could have happened that Waveman threw out there sounds incredibly legit because I would imagine that most people. If they saw a Bigfoot and they decided that they were going to capture this, like you would have to do something because they're incredible, they're probably incredibly strong, right? And there would probably be something that that would end up going down like this, where you just end up with a body. But my question is, is that if he did have the very first body of a Bigfoot ever discovered or ever taken? rather i mean he could be the richest person on earth (laughs) just like there's no reason to then go into all these great lengths to cover this whole thing up like some guy offers you a million dollars for it like heck no this is (laughs) what do you got write me a blank check you know (laughs) because this thing the smithsonian (laughs) i'm gonna sell this to a museum and i'm going to be set for the rest of my life right and it's just like, so where, why is there such great lengths to keep this thing under wraps? You know, he's got this peaked interest from these zoologists and biologists and anthropologists and all these sorts of things, right? They want to study it. They could tell immediately, this is not a person. You know, this is a, you know, what they would say is a missing link, or they would say, well, this is a, another species, but they, they wouldn't say this is a human being. And even if it was a missing link, you know, missing link it wouldn't have human rights <laughs> you know? so it's it's not like he's going to go to prison for murder an animal. right so it's like it's not like he's going to go to prison for murder right so it doesn't but make you, sense whether you these, also these have things. to remember how much knowledge was there about a bigfoot like creature in 1965 when when was the patterson gimlin film that was Jeez. later right that was 69 um 
Let, let's talk about something is, else while I, rec- while I look it up. My whole thing is, okay, uh, sounds great. Sounds like you got the forensic, let's just call it the forensic evidence of this thing being shot, beaten, right, or whatever. Fine. How come Frank can't just stick to that story? Uh, Peterson I, Gimlin film came out in 67. 67. Okay. So if just, Frank shot just this after. Thing, if, so, okay, anybody who's walking around in the woods with a rifle, a hunter, okay, shoots an animal or anything that is large or rare or anything like that, they are incredibly proud of the fact that they did this thing, right? So mm-hmm. why would Frank not just own that rather than trying to put it off on these 30,000 so, other you know, that soup. Hold on. Hold on. Let me fill in some blanks here. Okay. <laughs> We're going to kind of skip ahead a little bit here. He is a 20 year retired married man with three young boys. Okay. What if, because you got to remember, there's not a lot of knowledge about Bigfoot. Even when the Patterson Gimlin film, film originally hit, it still took a couple years to really spread around. Okay. And even then, you had all kinds of people calling BS. Everyone yeah. was calling BS. So this man, one, didn't have an interest in Bigfoot, as far as we know. I mean, we knew, you know, I'm not going to say that because that's jumping ahead. Um, but personally, I think the man was scared. Okay. Okay. He was put into a situation where he killed something that the by looking at it, he thought was a man. Okay. In 1960, in 1967, how many people even knew about gorillas? Well, okay. Listen, I mean, I'm sure some the, people did. Forget but not about the, the Bigfoot thing. I don't buy that for a second. He wasn't scared of what he had done because he was gallivanting around showing everybody what, what he had. I think that maybe he was threatened by the alphabet soup. I think maybe they said, you know, shut your face and tell people that it's fake or we're going to kill your whole family. I think he was an opportunist. <laughs> Jeff's like, yeah, no, probably. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that he was an opportunist, okay, that was also scared of what could potentially happen to him. He wanted to make money off of this. He knew what he had. He had something big. He knew that he had something big. But he was trying to be as weary as possible. I don't know why I'm flashing my wallet. Um, <laughs> look out his badge. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, he knew what he had, but he didn't know what to do with it. He didn't have the money to put it on display and make money off of it. Uh, he knew it was valuable. But he was also worried that this could potentially mean a murder charge if this thing was verified as like a wild man. You also have to remember, I don't know how much you guys know about uh, urban legends and other stories of wild people in America. But in the the 40s to 80s, 90s, and even a little bit today, when you're talking about Tennessee, there are stories of wild people. Okay. Um. That fur, no, dude, you don't. <laughs> you gotta think, man. You're in the '60s, dude. You you don't know. You don't know this. I mean, he could have thought that he. I, man, I wish we could. Hippies do out two there tonight. going all natural. I wish we could do know. part two tonight. I, I wish we could. <laughs> I wish that we had a name for this unnamed rich person that gave him all the money to do that because you keep saying unnamed person unnamed man that really bothers me because how do we know that this guy exists and Hanson wasn't just making him up and he's the one who actually had the money but or or he had an alternate personality and Fuck. his I personality had the wait. money or <laughs> I don't like the unnamed man thing I'm no, that, really that's... stuck on that that's a hundred percent. The dude, the, the mystery man from California doesn't exist. In my opinion, Frank had money. He was probably smuggling things from Vietnam, right? When he was a pilot. So he had money stashed away, guaranteed buried in the backyard. And he, I agree. He was smuggling, but go ahead. There, there was no California man that owned this thing. I don't, Th- that doesn't make I don't sense. agree. He had a he mattress sh- stuffed okay. with cash. Let's just, say, let's, just just say, let's just say he shot the thing. Why would somebody in California own it? 
I do. I don't wow. want to jump too far ahead, man. How but much? Basically, how much more I, could you have? Like this is this is <laughs> deep. This is destroying this podcast right now. I wish I had my shill ball cap that'll be here tomorrow because it'd be perfect for this episode. <laughs> oh man, I wish. Let's just I go wish. to the next spot. We we need. I need more. Let's just, uh, just... Okay. Yeah. All, <laughs> all, right, right, all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> You're ruining relationships all right. right now with this horror right. story. <laughs> Again, what is it? In 1969, Bernard Huevelmans wrote his initial scientific report on the Minnesota Iceman. In this report, he stated many different things that it could potentially be, including a Neanderthal, an up, an undiscovered upright walking ape, or a missing link in the evolution of man. But one thing that he claims to be upset he did not think of at the time was that it could be a hybrid between a man and an ape. I know this sounds crazy, but it is highly theorized with tons of witness submissions from the time that between the years of 1952 and 1953, Russia created hybrids by way of artificial insemination with Mongol women and sperm from gorillas. This was also documented as being an actual experiment by the Soviet doctor, Dr. Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov in French East Africa in 1926 and 1927 of course this was recorded as failing and of course we know not to question what anybody says in history especially the government right jeff uh this was Trust briefly discussed <laughs> in wavelman's book as well and we would go on to point out that this is not impossible to do on the scale of genetics like animals have been known to successfully breed infertile offspring that are hybridized versions of their mother and father species but as seen in the example of the liger a hybrid of a lion and tiger hybrids of certain mixtures have other aspects that may expand certain features of the hybrid in this or in the liger we see a hybrid animal that grows to be much larger than either parent species this is due to what is called genome, genomic imprinting or the unusual expression of genes depending on the parent of origin. As in the case of a lioness who will breed with many males from the pride and can carry children from multiple fathers, this causes the male genetics to create the largest cub possible to create a dominant embryo in the womb with limited space so that only his genes can be born. But lionesses have genes that react to this and inhibit the growth of their unborn, ensuring that many different cubs can survive. And just a side note, it is the the uh, the creation of the liger that actually proved this or uh, created the finding of this, by the way, uh, as in the cases. OK, that's what we did. Tigresses, on the other hand live a solitary lifestyle and will only breed with one male. So this gene does not exist in her and the gene to create a large offspring do not exist in the male as there is no genetic competition in the biology of the animal. The only competition for the male's biology is external to the mother. Now, when a male lion with his supercharged growth gene impregnates a female tiger that does not have a natural suppression in her genetics you get massive ligers that are larger than both parents and vice versa when you have male tigers without a massive growth gene that impregnates a lioness with a gen with genetics that halts the growth of the cubs you will get petite tigons who are smaller than both parents this although is most likely not the case but we cannot rule it out without dissection and genetic testing. So this remains a possibility, although a slight one. For example, if this were to happen, it would be believed that the man-ape hybrid would reach maturity faster than humans do. They would have incredible muscle definition, large misshapen appendages, such as feet and hands, much more hair than the average human, and have strength that is unrivaled by any man. Well, so maybe. But what about the idea that the Iceman was a fake? 
Now, the official understanding of this story is that the Iceman was a fabricated doll of sorts and that there never was a switch of the bodies. This is what the masses believe when it comes to the Minnesota Iceman. But I say, hold on. Understand that the FBI and the Smithsonian were involved in the Minnesota Iceman case. This has been proven, with both of these organizations being less than truthful to the masses on numerous occasions throughout our history. I think that it would be sort of foolish to believe that the narrative or believe the narrative that the Minnesota Iceman was not a biological creature. Yes, it is true that eventually it was proven that what was below the glass and ice of the chest freezer was a fabricated ice man near the end of the exhibit's existence. But there are pictures and scientific documentation from well-regarded scientists that tell a different story. That story being that at the time of Wavelman's and Sanderson traveling to Minnesota to study the ice man, there was biological matter trapped under the ice. And I think we have gone over enough of that evidence already today. But what about the other kind of fake? The fake body that is fabricated, that is a fabricated suit of a Neanderthal man, but the meat and viscera of what could be any kind of meat butchered or sold at the market or a human body in a primate costume. Well, without a biopsy, this is another thing that cannot be proven to be true or a hoax. The fact is, it could have been. But again, Due to extreme detail that would have to be have would have to have been done to the Iceman, the likeliness of this being the case is very slim. It just wasn't worth it for someone to put that much effort into something that was going to be frozen and sold as an attraction. The biological, physical, and chemical clues that they would have to have placed in particular locations to tell the story that the Minnesota Iceman told Bernard Wavelmans would have to be done by a very good craftsman with extensive knowledge in biology, ballistics, and organic decomposition in order to pass it off as a real creature. So again, very unlikely, especially when there were features such as moles, scars, veins under the skin, wrinkles, scratches, and pores found on the body. Okay. All right. Track with me here. Ready? Are you following? Ready? Here we go. Mm, yeah. Frank, this is just a theory. Frank was somehow involved or connected to secret chimera experiments happening in the United States. Okay. Chimera, for anybody who doesn't know, is exactly what Jeremy was talking about a minute ago with these like human animal hybrids and, you know, that kind of thing. So was this man being in the military, right? Maybe he was somehow connected to some chimera experiments. Maybe, if not him, somebody shot this thing. And then he gallivanted around showing it off until the alphabet soup boy showed up and threatened him, like Jake said. And that's why nobody could do any real experiments on it because they can't allow the public to know that we are doing chimera experiments. I can see it. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Nothing sounds too far-fetched when it comes to this story. Because, I mean, that would at least explain that, yes, maybe it is an actual being of some kind, a non-human being, or at least not fully human, right? It would explain his not being able to keep his story straight because that's a big lie to cover, right? So you gotta, you're all over the place with it. It would explain at least partially the intelligence agencies of some kind showing up. It would explain why people high up in the Smithsonian and anthropologists and all these other people were actually interested in this thing because it was an actual creature. And that could also explain why it went missing because nobody's allowed to know. So I don't not, I don't disagree with you. Right. And just to kind of build off of it, it's not my running theory. My, my running theory still is that this was a Bigfoot. Um, but it would make sense because what, you know, just to kind of add on to this, what if Bigfoot in general was a chimera and that Theodore Roosevelt put aside the national park system to put all of the failed chimeras or 
uh, successful chimeras aside and let them live in peace. I don't know. Just kind of building on what you said there. Maybe. I'm pretty sure I've actually said that in one of the Bigfoot episodes before that it's possible that all Bigfoots are uh, experiments. Mm, yeah. I think you've only been here for one Bigfoot episode. No, we've done a couple. Well, we talk about it every single episode. I'm pretty sure I've said that. Prove it. We've never talked about it. it okay. If I didn't say it on this show, I said it on my show, but I know for a fact that I'm on the internet somewhere saying that. So. No, he definitely is. I'm so, sure he is. Basically, I'm shit. So I'm sitting here writing my notes as you're speaking. So Frank was getting freaky with Miss Lady Sasquatch somewhere in Minnesota, <laughs> right? And they made this hybrid son of his and they kept it, he kept it in the basement like Sloth from the Goonies. And so finally, <laughs> Sloth broke loose. And in an attempt to get him back, he had to put Sloth down. That's what this sounds like to me. That, you know, and I was sitting here cracking up, you know, muted when you were giving your spiel. I'm because sure I'm were. like, yes, we're blaming the Russians, you know. <laughs> Just like, oh, the Russians. <laughs> the Russians with their experiments. And I'm not saying that the Russians aren't doing experiments like that. because. Well, why not? Um, but to then take their their chimera that they've created and release it into Minnesota, or release it into <laughs> Vietnam, you know, it's just like okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, hey, if we're that closely genetically linked, and someone gets bored enough in Minnesota, you know, and sees a lady Sasquatch <laughs> and has a particular fetish, you know. Sloth from the Goonies just shows up, <laughs> you know, talking about Rocky Road and stuff, you know, baby Ruth. <laughs> just so we're clear, we're talking about the Minnesota just south of Finland, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> which is right up there. So. All right. <laughs> hey, you guys. <laughs> Poor Manitoba. <laughs> All right. We're at the last last section for part one. Let's just get this over with. Ready to roll? <gasps> mm -hmm. Yep. The rubber clone. J. Edgar Hoover decided that there was not enough proof that this was a homicide after their first intervention in the Iceman fiasco. This gave Hansen the confidence to reappear to the public two months after polling the exhibit in response to Waveland's report. But this time, with the new rubber model, Hansen made a spectacle of the return by inviting various outlets of the media to come to the farm and take as many pictures of the copy as they pleased. Mr. Hansen did not hide the fact that this was not the original. In fact, he openly talked about it to reporters and claimed that the original would never be seen again. Some very noticeable differences were found between the copy and the photos of the original that were taken by Sanderson and Waveland. This time, the ice was much clearer. The big toes were spread further apart, the mouth was open, all of its teeth were visible, and now the right hand was much more visible. After this new exhibit made the mainstream, John Napier suddenly changed his mind. Cat just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> about, it <laughs> tickled my feet. Um, about how credible the original claims by Sanderson and Huevelmans actually were and reversed his efforts with the Smithsonian as well. So the Smithsonian began to distance itself away from the ice van and claimed that both versions of the exhibit were mere stuffed costumes. In fact, they were convinced that both versions were just the exact same thing, just defrosted, shifted, and refrozen. They would put out this statement about their discontinued interest in the exhibit of the Minnesota Iceman. Quote, the Smithsonian Institution is no longer interested in what has been called the Minnesota Iceman because it is convinced that this creature is nothing but a fairground fabrication made of a foam rubber and hair, a reliable source which the Smithsonian is not authorized to reveal has provided information regarding the owner of the model as well as to date and place of its fabrication. This information, together with some recent suggestions by Ivan T. Sanderson, the scientific writer and original discoverer of the Iceman, on how to construct such a creature have convinced us beyond reasonable doubt that the original model and the alleged current substitute are one and the same. 
the director of the primate biology program of the Smithsonian, Dr. John Napier, points out that this institution has always maintained an attitude of skepticism combined with an open mind and that its only interest in this affair is to discover the truth, which is reasonably certain is as stated above. From that point on, the Smithsonian refused to involve themselves any further in the mystery of the Minnesota Iceman. And you want to know why? Part one. Yes. You want to know course. why? Because they were threatened to. The alphabet soup boy says you cannot examine this thing. You cannot shed any more light on this thing because it is a secret government chimera project, and we can't allow it. That's why they're not authorized to say anything more. It's done. That's what I think. My final thoughts, at least as of now, are that this was a government experiment that they shot and that dude went rogue and then they told him to stop and that's it. I don't I don't disagree. I'm just not on the chimera side. I think it was a Bigfoot. But we'll get into that in okay, part two. Fair enough. Well, I mean you're biased. You you want it to be a Bigfoot, I am. That's okay. I do. You're right. <laughs> You're right. That's okay. I want a little to be a biased. Chimera. So we're both biased <laughs> in our beliefs here. So it's fair. How long are we going to have to wait for part two? Because I might not sleep until I hear the rest of this. <laughs> I am so ramped up right now. Like I'm going to start the second that we're off of here. I'm going to start printing out pictures, put them up on the walls with like red <laughs> yarn and like going all over the place and stuff, circling people, uh. crossing out people's faces. It's going to be crazy. Just read the rest of his presentation. Don't do oh, that. Yeah. Don't. Oh, no, yeah. No, yeah. No. I guess we can do that. Can't oh, we? No. It's all over it. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy's panicking. <laughs> yeah. The Guys, national. No. He's, he's reading it and it's going to be like the National Institute of Butthole Research. Oh, Jake. You can remove it. I already downloaded it, Jeremy. So Did you really? You yeah. And I'm going to post it all over the internet. No. Oh, no, please. No. It's one. It's not done. Okay. I'm not done with my it's research. Full tachos, please, That's no. <laughs> literally why I had to split this in two is because I'm not done. I was not ready for this today. I gave you the part that was done, found a good break Gosh. in the content. There is as much, if not more, if not less, <laughs> content. I'm tired, but I would push off sleep to listen to the rest. Well, I mean, Not do you want to you want to just record part two, and then if I need to, no, no, <laughs> I want you to finish with it. It's no. my bedtime, dude. I'm just saying, I'm I'm invested. This is a this is a good, this is a great story. This is one of the <laughs> best Bigfoot mystery stories we've done, and I'm just like, because it's it's not easy to just because I mean Jeff's doing it. It's not easy to just be like, this is fake. Because then the next part comes out, it's like, well, okay, this could be real. And then it's fake again. And then it's a chimera. And then it's a fake chimera. And then it's going to be all big feeder chimeras. And Don't then it's going to be fake me by again. now, Jake? Don't you know that this is the next she's going to call it a false flag. But it that's is. just like, but that's the, this is a really dang good episode because, you know, I'm not able to just make an opinion right off the bat and be like, well, this is where it doesn't line up and this is why I know it's fake. Because then you bring out this freaking biologist that's going to throw this incredibly detailed synopsis out talking about how ice freezes. And I'm like, oh, shoot, I don't know. (laughs) 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 Well, I mean, do you guys want to record part two tomorrow? We could just, I mean, we'll release it in two weeks, but we can record it tomorrow. I can't tomorrow. I can't do that either. I have to. I mean, I well, could, but I have other things I have to. Do when's the with. earliest that everyone can get together? We'll talk about this after we after we close yeah. out. Yeah. Yes. Does anybody have any closing thoughts other than Jeff and his chimeras? Um, for part one. The story's all over the place, man. It is all it is. over the place, and I'm I'm here for it. So here's 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 like a big teaser for part two, right? This is part one. This is what happens with part two. Man, that's like, it like closes or something. Yeah. <laughs> Only people listening or watching on the Paranormal Network. Both Good hands person. come together in the middle. Oh, never mind. Jake just <laughs> grabbed it for everybody. Ruined it all. It's like most hole, but there's actual like proof behind it. <laughs> it's so much better. I don't know. Most hole is pretty good. 
Mel's hole. This is a, this is a, Mel's a, ditch. Alert. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like there it is. It's Mel's ice man. <laughs> yep. Mel's, Mel's ice man. <laughs> All right. Well, if you guys have nothing else to say, then I'm wait. Hold on a second. So I just want to just question just came up. So the reason why things don't rot when they're talking about cave bears and uh woolly mammoths and, and stuff the reason why they don't rot is because of the vegetation layer and the mud that's around them when they're frozen in the ice Some, and it kind of like preserves them i didn't go into the science of it it's literally um hold on let me control f i know it's some sort of acid uh bactericide acids like tannic or humic acid uh this kind of peat peat i know is like a um like a compression rotten yeah, vegetation it, yeah. it's like organic matter right yeah uh has a tendency to prevent decomposition i don't know why i don't know how uh okay. Huevelman is the scientist he sounds like a pretty smart guy and he's a respected guy in the bigfoot world so i maybe take his word a little bit too much for it but anyway so they're, they're <laughs> suggesting that basically because it was frozen in just water that the decomposition would continue but at a slower rate yes because even in a block of ice perfect uh preservation doesn't happen until you're closer to like absolute zero um which we just don't get cold enough here on this planet to really do that decomposition will continue to happen just like if you if you left a, a chicken a full chicken in your deep freezer three years later, you pulled it out, defrost it. It's going to stink. Right. No, um, I agree. I, I had a, uh, when I was a kid, I found a dead bullfrog and I froze it inside of a coffee can. I put it in my parents like garage freezer. And within three days, my mom went in there to go find some like, you know, whatever. Right. And she opened it up and she's like, what is inside of this thing? And there was none of it was exposed. It was completely co covered in ice. You know, it was mm -hmm. completely sealed up in there. I just wanted to preserve it because I was, you know, More I have right. three brothers. She has four boys. You know, she has to deal with it. It's such a boy thing to yeah. do. I love it. <laughs> but it's just like, so yeah, I mean, I can get behind that. You know, the the scientific analysis of why this would have to be something that wasn't found, but instead was made. Like, not saying the body in particular, but the circumstances around it. It's mm -hmm. just, it's so... Man, it's like hit me on all the different levels, like the ballistics and like what actually happens to a body and all those sorts of things, decomposition, the the you know, the gas is escaping, all this sort of stuff. It's just like dang. Right. So, so I'm like back if, there in like the it, whole this is real, but this book is amazing. It's not my only source, but it is a source that I I uh, use primarily for this research. I mean, it is thick. This is a book on the minnesota iceman okay this is 275 pages of i mean fairly good print if i, if I knew how to read i would <laughs> read that book um like if somebody really wants to dive into this on a much more detailed like i'm just creating a summary for you guys mm -hmm. this here between him and uh Huevelman and the Bigfoot book by Lauren Coleman. Um there's another one by William Jevning that I used. Um that book right there. Highly, highly recommended if anybody wants to get into the science behind the Minnesota Iceman. That is the book you need to get. So just Quick, did you say that there was a name for this California man? Did I hear that right? No. Or was I no? Nope. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm okay. not a hundred percent done with my research yet. I am like ninety-five percent done. There's just some things I want to kind of clear up for part two before I'm ready. Cause I was planning on this being episode one oh one. Um but <laughs> it still is. Sorry. No, I'm just giving you shit. Um so I mean, I can, I, who knows, maybe in my research it comes up. There's theories. There's theories, but nothing's been confirmed. I'm really Arnold stuck on this unnamed thing. Like, What's that, Jeff? Oh. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I don't think it's Arnold. 
It's Ani. <laughs> Maybe it's Jake. It's the gummy bear of candy corn, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the magically plurid on. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, very well, very well. We'll we'll end it on that. And <laughs> if you enjoyed part one of the Minnesota Ice Man. Trust me, you do not want to miss out on part two. I can tell you for a fact that we will have some really good conversations going on through that one, especially when we break down Hanson's story of what really happened in Minnesota when he shot a Bigfoot. Spoiler alert. We'll see you next time. It's a Bigfoot. <laughs> on the infinite rabbit hole goodbye bye bye